Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton, and this is the podcast of my book, Philosophy the Classics. You can find out more about this book and others I've written at www.virtualphilosopher.org. Or you might like to listen to another podcast I've made with David Edmonds. It's called Philosophy Bites, Bites with an I, and that's at www.philosophybites.com. Arthur Schopenhauer, The World as Will and Idea. The world as will and idea has often been compared to a symphony in four movements. Each of its four sections has a distinctive mood and tempo, and Schopenhauer returns to and develops themes touched upon in earlier sections. The book opens with an abstract discussion of our relation to the world we experience, the world as we represent it to ourselves, that's the world as idea. In the second section, this discussion broadens out, suggesting that there is a deeper reality than the world which science describes. This world, the thing in itself, the world as will, can be glimpsed when we observe our own willed bodily movements. The third section is an optimistic and detailed discussion of art. Here Schopenhauer develops his claim that art can provide an escape from the relentless willing that is the normal human condition, whilst revealing aspects of the deeper reality, the world as will. Finally, a darker pessimism takes over in the fourth section. Here he explains why we are doomed to suffering by our very nature. Yet there is a glimmer of hope if we are prepared to live a life of asceticism, relinquishing our desires. The world as idea. When Schopenhauer begins the world as will and idea with the line, the world is my idea, he means that experience is always from the perspective of a perceiving consciousness. We represent the world to ourselves rather than have immediate access to the underlying nature of reality. But the world as idea doesn't yield knowledge of the true nature of things. If we rest satisfied with appearances, we're like a man who goes around a castle trying to find its entrance, stopping every now and then to sketch the walls. According to Schopenhauer, this is all philosophers until now have done. His philosophy, however, purports to give us knowledge about what lies behind those walls. The question of the ultimate nature of reality is the central question of metaphysics. Schopenhauer accepts Immanuel Kant's division between the world as we experience it, what Schopenhauer calls the world as idea, and the underlying reality of the thing in itself. Kant calls the reality behind experience the noumenal world. Schopenhauer calls it the world as will. We aren't simply passive recipients of sensory information, rather we impose the categories of time, space and causation on all our experience. But at the level of the thing in itself, the world as will, these categories don't apply anymore. The world as will is an indivisible whole. What Schopenhauer calls the Principium Individuationis, the division into particular things, only occurs in the phenomenal world. The world as will is the entirety of all that exists. The world as will. It might seem that the world as will is by definition inaccessible to human beings, since it would seem not to be accessible through experience. However, Schopenhauer declares that in our experience of willing, the power we have to move our own bodies, the world as will shows itself. The will isn't separate from bodily movement, it's an aspect of that movement. When we become conscious of our own willing, we go beyond the world as idea and can get a glimpse of the thing in itself. We experience our own body both as idea, another object encountered in the world, and as will. For Schopenhauer, it's not just human beings who are manifestations of will. Ultimately, everything is an expression of will. In other words, he uses the word will in an extended sense. A lump of rock, for instance, is an expression of will. The will that he describes is not an intelligence. It's a blind, directionless striving which condemns most human beings to lives of suffering. Art. Art has a preeminent position in Schopenhauer's philosophy. The contemplation of works of art allows us to escape momentarily from the relentless grind of willing that is otherwise inevitable. Art allows us a disinterested aesthetic experience. When we contemplate a work of art, we can and should set aside any practical concerns and cares, any notion of the work of art serving a function for us. We lose ourselves in contemplation. The same is true of our experience of beauty and nature, we can achieve this state of peaceful contemplation looking at a waterfall or a mountain just as much as at a great painting. Artistic geniuses can achieve this state of disinterested contemplation of objects and events and have the intellectual ability to communicate their emotion to audiences of their work. Such geniuses have the capacity for pure knowing. They can experience the platonic forms of what they perceive. Plato famously believes that the chair I'm sitting on 
is an imperfect copy of an ideal chair, the form of the chair. For Plato, an artist who paints the chair puts the view at several removes from the real chair, the platonic form. This is one of his reasons for banning artists from his ideal republic. They deal in distant copies of reality, and so distance us from the forms. Schopenhauer, in contrast, believes that artistic geniuses can, through their work, reveal the forms or platonic ideas of the particular things which they depict or describe. Thus, artistic geniuses allow us to escape from the power of will and achieve an impersonal knowledge of the platonic forms. Beautiful objects and scenes are well suited to jolt us out of the endless stream of desiring. Some depicted objects, however, are better suited to this than others. We can contemplate the beauty of depicted fruit, for example, but our practical interests may make it very difficult to remain entirely disinterested, particularly if we're hungry. Similarly, some paintings of nudes are easier to contemplate with disinterest than others. Some tend to arouse the viewer sexually, thereby reasserting a practical interest. Sublime objects and scenes, in contrast to those which are simply beautiful, are ones which are in some way hostile to the human will. They threaten with their immensity or power. Black thunderclouds, huge bear crags, a river rushing in torrent, all these can be sublime. The aesthetic experience of the sublime is achieved by consciously detaching yourself from the will, lingering pleasurably over what would otherwise be terrifying. This, again, reveals the platonic forms of the objects contemplated. The platonic forms revealed in the aesthetic contemplation of art and nature are important to Schopenhauer because they allow us a kind of knowledge of the thing in itself, the world as will. We can't get direct knowledge of the thing in itself by this means, but the platonic forms give what he calls the most adequate objectification of the will. This simply means that the world they reveal is not subjectively distorted, but is as close as is possible to the thing in itself. Music. Music differs from the other arts in that it doesn't represent the world as idea. It doesn't usually represent anything at all, yet it's undeniably a great art. Schopenhauer gives it a special place in his system. Music, he says, is a copy of the will itself. This explains its profundity. It can reveal to us the very nature of reality. Music which is sad doesn't express a particular person's sadness or suggest sadness in a particular context. It expresses sadness in its essential nature, removed from particular circumstances. Ultimately, though, it is a copy of the will. A consequence of this view is that music is a kind of unconscious metaphysics. It gives us a picture of the thing in itself, just as the metaphysician attempts to explain to us what lies behind the veil of appearance. Schopenhauer is well aware that his views on music and its relation to the thing in itself are unverifiable. There is no way of comparing a Beethoven string quartet with the thing in itself to see if he's correct. However, he presents his account as a plausible explanation of music's power and suggests that the reader should try listening to music bearing in mind the theory. Free will. All phenomena are bound by the principle of sufficient reason. The principle that for everything there is a reason why it is as it is. This applies as much to human beings as it does to rocks and plants. Our behaviour is, then, entirely determined by biology, past events, our character. We only have the illusion of acting freely. However, the will, the thing in itself, is entirely free. So human beings are both determined and free. The suggestion that we're, if only at the phenomenal level, determined, is a pessimistic one. And this stream of pessimism runs through the whole book. It becomes a raging torrent when Schopenhauer focuses on the nature of human suffering. Suffering and salvation. Here, Schopenhauer draws heavily on a tradition of Asian philosophy, including Buddhist and Hindu teachings. Sustained periods of happiness are an impossibility for human beings. We're so constructed that our lives involve constant willing, seeking satisfaction. When we achieve what we desire, we may enjoy momentary happiness, which is nothing more than the relief from wanting what we were seeking. But this is inevitably short-lived. We either sink into a state of ennui, an intense state of boredom, or else find that we still have unfulfilled desires which drive us on to seek their satisfaction. All human life is tossed backwards and forwards between pain and boredom. Yet if we gain insight into the true nature of reality, if we see through the veil of Maya, that is, gain knowledge of the world as will, then there's a chance of salvation and of a permanent escape from suffering a state which is at least as blissful as the temporary states of disinterested contemplation which art can afford. A first step in this direction is the recognition that inflicting harm on others is actually a kind of self-injury. 
since at the level of the will, the person who inflicts harm and the person who suffers it are one. It's only at the level of phenomena that we perceive them as different. If we see this, then we'll recognise all suffering as in a sense our own and be motivated to prevent such suffering. We will recognise that when one person harms another, it is as if the will were a crazed beast which sinks its teeth into its own flesh, not realising that it was injuring itself. The more extreme move which Schopenhauer outlines at the end of the world as will and idea is asceticism, a deliberate denial of the will to life. The ascetic lives a life of sexual chastity and poverty, not in order to help others, but rather to extinguish desire and ultimately to mortify the will. By this extreme policy, the ascetic escapes the otherwise inevitable suffering of the human condition. Criticisms of the world as will and idea Fragile Metaphysical Foundations Schopenhauer's book sets out a system of thought which has fragile metaphysical foundations. The entire framework relies on our gaining knowledge of the thing in itself, or at least some access to it, via our awareness of our own willed bodily movements. But if Schopenhauer is mistaken about the possibility of such access to the world as will, then the entire work is undermined. It seems at times that Schopenhauer wants to have his cake and eat it. He wants to say both that the veil of Maya prevents us from knowing about the ultimate nature of reality, and that we can see through this veil on occasion. However, even if we reject the metaphysical foundations of Schopenhauer's thought, there are many insights about art, experience and suffering that can be gleaned from his book. The fact that a system as a whole may be flawed doesn't prevent Schopenhauer from providing us with a rich source of ideas and speculation. It's not surprising, then, that many practising artists have found Schopenhauer's work inspirational. Hypocrisy Schopenhauer preached asceticism as the route to salvation and an end to the suffering that would otherwise be an inevitable feature of the human condition. Yet he didn't practice what he preached. He didn't practice sexual chastity and he enjoyed a good meal. So why should we take such a hypocrite seriously? This attack doesn't seriously damage Schopenhauer's philosophy. It's entirely possible for someone to recognise the route to salvation without actually pursuing it himself. Whilst hypocrisy is an unattractive character trait, it doesn't affect the strength of his arguments. If Schopenhauer was right that asceticism provides a way of eliminating suffering, then this is completely independent of how he actually chose to live his life.